Thanks very much. Uh, David, I was going to say Chris there. Uh, thanks, for, thanks very much for, for the, uh, the, the welcome and introduction. Can, can I say, uh, first of all, it's very kind words from uh, David. Uh, I always have Chris, in, or I'm going to have Chris in my mind all the time now when I'm, 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 I'm saying David. Um, thanks very much, uh, David, for the, for the introduction. But can I say, uh, from the perspective of the Community Relations Council, not only is it great to be here, um, but Chris is one of those organizations that as a funder, they're a delight. Uh, they're a delight because uh, I think you only have to have some little contact with uh, David and Lisa and Emily and all of the other people involved, the small team involved, small contact with them to realize the huge passion there is from that team for the work that they do, the massive commitment that they have to improve the lives of the parents and the children, young people they work with, but also the commitment to make this place a, a better place. And they also deliver, and they deliver good outcomes for the relatively small amount of money that they get from organizations like the Community Relations Council. Uh, I always say when a funder goes out to meet groups that are funded, the, the groups say thank you to the funder. Uh, it should be the other way around. And from the funder that is the Community Relations Council, uh, there's a very big thank you uh, that we uh, owe to Chris and the staff and the board and everybody else for what they do for this place um, because it is phenomenal and deserves a lot more support than they even get. So thank you to Lisa and to David and everybody else. And that, that guy, Chris, whoever he is, he keeps cropping up, but nobody ever sees him. I've been asked to talk briefly about the peace building context. Um, and there are a number of things I'd like to say which would last probably about two hours, so let me just concentrate on a, on a few points. I actually want to go back to an experience I had. It's one of my first memories ever uh, as a very young boy. And we were going on holiday. It's a memory that I suspect if you're over 30 or 40 in this audience, you'll, you'll, you'll know something similar. We, I was a very young boy. We were going on holiday. A lot of bombs had gone off in Belfast city centre. Uh, we weren't allowed to take a car in. You weren't allowed to get a lift in from somebody. Then they stopped taxis going in. We had to get a bus to get onto the ferry. And I really remember uh, with my family, I was about that high, not really carrying anything. The bus we were due to get was about 100, 200 yards away from the stop. And there was a discussion and my parents decided not to run for the bus. And I'm delighted they did that because the bus that we then got five or ten minutes later was stopped on the Queen Elizabeth Bridge. And I have a, my, one of my earliest memories, an acute memory, of a police officer, as we got off that bus, crying, screaming, saying they've bombed Oxford Street bus station. And it was in the middle of Bloody Friday. And I remember looking over the parapet of Queen Elizabeth Bridge and seeing dust and smoke in the air and a really sweet smell. I can still smell, if I put my mind to it, which I assumed at the time was burning bodies, but I assume was probably just the effect of the explosion. And it had a massive impact on me. I, I don't think any child anywhere should have that as one of their first memories, but it's one of my first memories. And I suspect there are hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of people in this place who have a first memory like that. And it reminds me all the time also of just how horrible this place was to live in 30, 40, and 50 years ago. That was in 72, I think. One of my other memories is standing, as uh, David said, in the room when the Good Friday Agreement was agreed to. And you look at some of the pictures, and I see myself. I had no hair in those days as well, uh, David, but you see yourself applauding. And I remember the huge amount, first of all, shock that it had been done, and then the huge amount of hope there was around the table that this was going to be a step change. And a few years ago, as a third memory, I was invited to the Waterfront Hall when President Obama came. And I deliberately parked in the, water, uh, in the Odyssey car park and walked across the same Queen Elizabeth Bridge. And I stood in the same spot because I, I just have such an acute memory of what happened in 1972 except today I could look over the, the, uh, the, the side part of the bridge. And I looked down at what was then the site of the Oxford Street bus station. 
at the Waterfront Hall at the light in Belfast that morning, supplemented by the lights of the TV cameras, supplemented also by the hundreds of people that were there. And I looked around the city, I looked around the redevelopment, the optimism, the general sense of dynamism in the city, and I shed a tear because that memory was just so different to the last time really that I'd stood in that part of the bridge 40 odd years before. And so when you talk about peace building and where we are as a society, it's easy to forget how far we have come. It's easy to get frustrated with some of the ups and downs of, of where the political process is, for example, and not actually remember this society has already been transformed. And we always need to understand where we are now in the part of a longer term process. We are involved in a 50 year plus peace process. When this peace process, if we are able to sustain it, comes to a positive conclusion, there are some of us in this room, maybe myself included, who may not be here. That's how long this process will take. And when you look at the context of 20 years since the agreement, in a 50 year plus process with bumps along the way, we're actually not badly placed in the context of everything else. But there are huge challenges. One of those challenges I think is that we have, we're involved in what some would call a pacted process. It's not a transformational process, hasn't been so far. Maybe that's something we need to think about. It's a pacted process. So some of the politicians and the players in the 70s and 80s and 90s were part of the agreement in 1998, and they're part of the process of negotiating how this society evolved since then. And so it's no surprise that we have a series of negotiations, bumps on the road sometimes, that are then resolved and moved on. And there are advantages to that. And you look at other peace agreements in other parts of the world, and you see how successful ours has been in relative terms. But there are also disadvantages to that. And I think we need to recognize those disadvantages in the context of, of where we are. One of those disadvantages is that we have become dominated over the last few years by the political process, by the institutions, by organizations. And we all know that peace building isn't about organizations or institutions. Peace building isn't just about the politics and the agreement that we have isn't owned just by the politicians, it's owned by civil society. Those of us who voted for it, those of us who want to make it work, doing the work on the ground, the, so the sort of work that Chris and all of the people involved with them are doing. So through the late 90s and early 2000s, we dismantled the infrastructure of conflict. But what we didn't do was dismantle the attitudes that had emerged before, during and after that conflict and it is hugely important to dismantle those attitudes. And at the core of that, which is what is at the core of what Chris does, is that we have to um, build relationships because it's relationships that will dismantle bigotry. It's relationships that will dismantle racism. It's relationships that will dismantle intolerance. It's relationships that will dismantle sectarianism. That's what peace building is about, not the institutions. It's about relationships. And unfortunately, when you look at some of, for example, the work that goes on on the ground and the huge courage that people show, and you look at the Community Relations Council with a budget reduction of 30% in five years, which we've tried to prevent being passed on to groups on the ground, but in reality, you have to. I think you also have to ask, are we really as a society, as a government, taking reconciliation seriously when we don't resource it as well as it should be resourced? Are we taking it seriously when the two governments, for example, who should be driving this process have not done that as well as they could over the last few years and they need to rediscover their concerted and visionary approach to how to build political understanding and reconciliation in this part of the world. They are the drivers for that, and they need to understand their critical role in doing that. Are we really taking reconciliation and peace building seriously when we haven't yet started to make systemic changes? As an organization, the CRC helps to manage division. I don't want us to be managing division in this part of the world. I want us 
to be tackling the causes of division? And are we really taking the peace process seriously, the need to build reconciliation seriously, when in education or in housing or in legacy issues or dealing with victims or in lawfulness or in a voice for civil society, we aren't doing some of the stuff that is going to transform this society. When you deal with education, the Ulster University report recently talked about, uh, I think, 60 odd thousand empty spaces in primary schools alone caused by the duplication of provision, costing up to 94 million pounds a year. And yet in other parts of education, schools are laying off classroom assistants and capital builders being delayed. And yet in primary school provision alone, it's cost, the, the segregated nature of our, of our education system is costing 90 odd million pounds. Are we really taking reconciliation seriously when a shared housing policy, which is really important, over a 10 year period, two terms in assembly, means 487 shared housing units, while, at the same 10 year while in the same 10 year period, we have 60,000 units being built in Northern Ireland, fewer than 1% part of the shared housing policy. And when UVF flags are put onto one of those shared housing units, it takes over six months to get them down. A prescribed organization unlawfully erecting flags in June. Some of them go down in September when people have to move out of their homes, but the rest of them we have to wait until Santa Claus arrives in December and people go up to put Christmas decorations up and, and then they take the flags down. Are we really taking reconciliation seriously when we have to wait for that? So, I'm conscious of time, David, I'm very sorry. Um, what are the four things out of that I would, I would um, put on the table? My goodness, we've made huge progress. Politicians are partly responsible for that. The governments are partly responsible for that. We need to recognize that. But we need to recognize it in the context of a 50-year process. At some point, sooner rather than later, we need to make systemic change to how this place works. Because segregation is damaging us and is not tackling the causes of division. Unless we do, we will come back to some things that haunted this society in the past. Relationships are critical. Programs like this are critical. But we need to resource it. And we need to resource these sort of programs better than we are at the minute. And finally, you'll be pleased to know, civil society really does need to find its voice and needs to find a mechanism for that voice to be heard because these issues that are difficult, civil society are way ahead of the game in finding the answers to them. Good luck with the conference. Thanks for the invitation. Sorry for taking up so much time.